Car crash cases, defective products, dangerous drugs, injuries, and abuse. Across the state of Alabama, the attorneys, proudly sponsored by the law firm of Hollis Wright, are here to serve you. Your tough legal questions answered by our experts. The attorneys with Josh Wright from the law firm of Hollis Wright and host David Lamb. Hello and welcome into the attorneys. Thank you so much for being with us tonight. Our topic of conversation is adoptions. If this is uh, something that interests you, you know somebody, maybe give them a call and give them a heads up that oh, for the next half hour, we've got a panel of experts to deal with this specific issue. Um, so take advantage of that and uh, we'd love to have you be a part. All throughout the program, you'll see ways at the bottom of the screen where you could join our conversation. And uh, the firm of Hollis Wright does a neat thing. They make available attorneys that are standing by live during this program. So for the next half hour, lawyers live standing by to speak with you. Those conversations take place off the air, so not for us to hear, so you'll have some privacy, but take advantage of that opportunity. Leading our conversation, he is the managing partner of the firm Hollis Wright, Josh Wright. Good to see you, sir. You too. Hope you had a great week. I did. Thank you. You know, there are a lot of topics, David, that we do where uh, we're uh, experts, if you will, on the legal mm -hmm. side of the topic. Tonight we're talking in the family law area right. uh, on the topic of adoption. And it's something that we don't do. And so when we talk about adoption and the legal issues associated with adoption, we go to experts. And that's what we have done today, uh, bringing Amy Osborne on. And Amy, just welcome uh, to be part of this uh, great uh, show to talk about adoption. We really appreciate you being on. Thank you for having me. All right, well, start us with this. Okay. Tell us a little bit about where you work, kind of what you do. Uh, we'll kind of work our way through it from there. Okay. Um, I work for Drew Whitmire, who is actually an attorney here in Birmingham. He's been practicing for over 40 years. Um, and I went to work for him um, about 15 years ago as his paralegal, um, doing estates and conservatorships, and have found my way into doing his adoptions. And so now we focus on the um, adoptions both interstate and um, within the state of Alabama. I find it interesting, I know you told us in kind of our pre-production meeting that uh, you started as a paralegal. I did. And you worked your way in, was a go-getter and said, you know what, I think I can do this. That's a great story. It yeah. is. You don't hear yeah. that, you, you just don't hear that very often. That's really cool though. Well, so you. you kind of recognize, all right, hey, I've done this as a paralegal, I can do this as a lawyer and I can be a good lawyer doing it. Exactly. So and is that it was eleven passion? So it didn't make it. You know, it's not a hard job. It's it's fun. Is that how you kind of got into the adoption itself, the adoption world? I actually um, had gone through school with human development and family studies as my degree, okay. and had worked with um, a organ a ministry doing save a life type uh, things with birth mothers and everything else, and helping the birth mothers make decisions as to whether they wanted to place or not. And that just um, a girlfriend called me up one day and says, "There's an." A adoption attorney that's needing a paralegal, would you be interested? And it was still within the adoption realm, so that's why I chose to go with them. So you've got a lot of experience, and I, I tell my paralegal a lot of times, she's doing more of the legal work than I feel like I'm doing. So I know how much experience it takes to be a paralegal and to work through it, because a lot of times, one of the nice things about being a paralegal is you're learning all the nuances of filings and the paperwork and the process that has to be used, whereas the lawyers sometimes do in the big picture. And when you have that context, have all that the general information, it makes you a better lawyer along the way. So I know that's probably helped you. Yeah, it all has. right, let's talk adoption. Okay. Um, because I know there are people in the viewing audience that watch this show uh, that sometimes will call about adoption and the process and whatnot. Um, kind of let's jump off just into the concept of adoption itself. Um, can you, number one, do you have to have a lawyer to do an adoption? In the state of Alabama, you do have to have an attorney. Okay. Um, we have a lot of people who will call us up and say, oh, I found all these forms online, blah, 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 I'm gonna fill them out and, and file them, and they get up to the courthouse and the courthouse tells them no. Unfortunately, you cannot file that. Alabama is, in the statute, the Alabama statute, they have put into the statute what the forms are supposed to have and everything else like that. And so they are very form specific. Um, so it is best to go ahead and just call an attorney, don't pay the fees online, get an attorney, make sure that the forms are correct and allow him to file it. Um, because you're not even allowed to file it in Alabama without okay. an attorney. So even if you do have the forms, unfortunately, you still have to have the attorney to file it. All right, so I'm a client coming to you. Yes, sir. And uh, I come into your office and I say, my wife and I would like to adopt. 
what is the process? Explain to us kind of the process of how that works. Because I know that's probably a misconception for a lot of people. Yes. They just assume you go to a lawyer, they kind of work it out, you pay a fee, and then you go through some probate proceeding. But the reality is there's a, there's a much longer step in that, isn't in there? There is a long step in that. Um, it it kind of depends on what you as a couple are looking for in the adoption process. Some people want to go through DHR, which is a wonderful place to, you know, to go through, get placed with a child, and um, go through the adoption process. Um, probably one of the, the cheapest ways, too, for the simple fact that the state of Alabama will pay for the adoption should you go that direction. Are those generally foster children that are in DHR they, custody? They are. They are wards oh. of the state. Um, and you do have to go through the process of the termination of parental rights and everything else. Okay. So a lot of times the children are placed with you going through that entire process. Other times you go in and the, the TPR has already been done oh. and the child is placed with you with the idea that you will be adopting. Um, and so that's, you know, that's one avenue that the couples can take and we kind of, you know, explain that to them. Um, sometimes couples don't, you know, they don't want to have to go through DHR. They just want to hire someone to find them a child and go from there. And at that point in time, we refer them to different agencies um, and tell them, you know, look, research agencies, you know, every agency is different. They all have different types of requirements. Um, and you kind of have to find out which agency works best for you. Mm -hmm. um, some, we have facilitators as well. Um, Alabama allows facilitators, and those are people that just do the placement. They're not really considered an agency. They place and then they walk out. Can I? Yeah, go ahead. Just, I'm, I'm curious, you have so much experience in this. You, you've just walked through so many people through this, and I know this mm -hmm. is a tough decision. And um, So for you, when somebody comes to you and says, uh, we, we think we want to adopt, do you have any advice about just kind of how to determine if if, uh, if if I'm right for adoption and if adoption mm -hmm. is right for me, kind of any ideas or any, any tips that you can help folks kind of figure out if this is something that they really want to do and kind of are qualified to do? Um, it just really kind of depends on the couple. We have some couples who will come to us and say, oh, I'm, you know, I want adoption, let's go, let's go. And they get through the adoption process and decide that this just isn't right for right. them. This is not what they were thinking it was going to be. I mean, this is, this is a lifelong commitment. Mm -hmm. This is not, you know, come in, think you're going to have a child and then return the child. I mean, right. you know, it's kind of the joke that, you know, we take no returns once the child's placed with yeah. you. You know, it's, it's yours. What, what's the timing of going through a regular adoption agency? Let's say you found your adoption agency from the time that you start to you get approval of the probate proceedings with help from your counsel. What's that time frame? It all depends on the agencies. Okay. Um, some agencies place like within a year. Um, which means that it would be about, you know, a year and a half if that's the case for the entire probate seat, uh, you know, from the beginning of when you're placed to when your um, finalization of adoption occurs. Um, and then others, we've had people who have waited five years. So, you know, it just kind of depends on the agencies. And that's why I say you really want to, you know, research your agency before you choose it because some take longer than others. Right. Um, we have, you know, different agencies within the state of Alabama that are all different you know ranges when we come back I want to talk about whether you're guaranteed if you want to go through adoption whether you're guaranteed to be placed with a child and if not what other options you may have uh, where you have to go to other areas of the world to get adoptions right. handled outside of the United States for example All so right. let's talk about that when you back. right there we'll step aside our first break of the evening as we head to break a couple of reminders how you can join our conversation we'd love to have you do so also you can find the firm of Hollis Wright search the term Hollis Wright to find uh, them on Facebook and on Twitter at Hollis underscore right. Stay tuned. More of the attorneys coming right up. I'm Josh Wright with the law firm of Hollis Wright, a personal injury law firm. Thank you for watching The Attorneys. Now we hope you, a friend, or a loved one never needs legal counsel for a case. But if you do, the goal of the show is simple. Provide answers and legal counsel when you need it the most. Your call to the show is free, so if you have questions specific to the show or related to other accident or injury-related topics, 
You can call, email, or text us. Or you can also follow us on Facebook or Twitter. Or simply contact us by going to hollis-right.com and click on the Contact Us link. We know your time is valuable, so thank you for spending it with us watching The Attorneys. Welcome back into the attorneys, adoptions and the law, the topic of conversation tonight. We'd love to have you be a part of the conversation, how you can do that at the bottom of the screen. Also a reminder throughout the program tonight, about 20 minutes or so remaining uh, in the show and in your opportunity to speak with an attorney live standing by to speak with you. Josh. All right. So when we went to break, um, I was getting into a topic that I want to talk about now, Amy, okay. and that is um, these adoption agencies probably have different criteria and categories of individuals that are primary for them versus secondary parents um, that would be entitled to um, adopt a child. How does that work, first of all, in general? Um, is it age-based? Is it socioeconomic-based? How, uh, how does that work? And in addition to that, not just how does it work, are you guaranteed to be able to adopt if you want to adopt? Um. Basically, with the agencies, you have to fall into their criteria. So, some agencies have age limits on them. You know, we, we as we've seen from the new laws that have passed recently, some have you know religious, um, that kind of stuff. So, I mean, you really have to research your your agencies and make sure that they are a good fit for you. It does not mean that you cannot adopt. But if you do fall out of those criteria for them, they will go ahead and let you go. At that point in time, you know, we always suggest word of mouth. Word of mouth is great. You can go to church, you can go to your OBGYN, anything, and just say, hey, listen, I'm looking to adopt. And if you can find your own child, then all you have to have is just an attorney to go ahead and get everything filed and, and, and they can do everything for you. And you wouldn't be necessarily not allowed to adopt. All right, and talk to me just for a moment, because um, I'd ask you off camera about international adoptions, because I've heard of friends of ours that have internationally adopted yes. and had wild success doing it. Mm -hmm. uh, that's changed. Has that changed recently, or is that just something that is not as prevalent as it used to be? Well, what's happened is the, the United States has become part of the Hague, and the, the countries basically <laughs> came through and said, hey, we want something that you know protects the children. So when you leave our, your, our country and go to your country, we want to know that your country is going to protect our children. And so in doing that, you now have what are called Hague countries and non-Hague countries. And in order to be able to adopt in the United States, you have to go to an agency that is a Hague accredited agency and adopt through them. A question we always get when we talk about adoption is the right of the birth mother after adoption has taken place. Can you just kind of walk us generally through that? Because I know that's kind of an interesting area of the law, kind of a complicated issue. But once a formal adoption has taken place yes. in probate court where it has been approved and you have parental rights, does the birth mother have the right down the road to come back and try and get that child back? Um, the mother doesn't. She, let's see how we put this, she doesn't have the right to come back. The courts will give her day in court to argue her point that, you know, it was either fraud or duress or something like that. But really and truthfully, she has five days to withdraw her consent in the state of Alabama with an additional nine to show the fraud and um, duress, coercion, or best interest of the child. Um, but once she's passed those time frames, she's really going to have a hurdle to get, you know, over to be able to get the child back. Um, so that's basically what, you know, her rights are. She, she loses her rights once those times have expired, but, you know, if she can prove to the court something different, gotcha. then you know, she can get she can get the child back. Mm -hmm. Question we've got here, what is involved in the home study process and who can conduct the home study? Okay, the home study process is basically done by like DHR um, or a child placing agency. Um, and then of course there's the independent social worker who is licensed to do home studies and post placements and birth parent interviews. Um, the home study process is just the process where the um, adoptive couple opens up their home to the social worker. She comes in and looks at it. They do have to give their um, FBI and ABI clearances, the child abuse and neglect clearances. Um, they have to, you know, provide just a whole lot of information on themselves. 
um, then she writes up a report and, and grants them as um, you know, able to adopt. And then that is provided to the agencies. Some agencies provide it to the birth parents so the birth parents can read over it. Um, and it's also provided to the court. Um, and it just basically says that they're stable individuals who can provide for a child. Um, talk about cost and how that's broken down for legal purposes and also for adopting a child through an agency and kind of in general terms. Okay, um, like I said before earlier, you know, DHR of course doesn't cost you anything. Um, if you're going through an agency, um, agencies can range widely, um, especially with like facilitators. You can be, at, you know, with a facilitator, you know, you're looking at probably anywhere between seven to, you know, 20,000. Some of the agencies can be as high as 60,000. Um, so it just kind of depends. And then, of course, um, a lot of these agencies will collect everything up front and they'll pay your attorney's fees. So in that 60,000, you'll get your attorney's fees paid for, your birth parent fees paid for, um, and all that kind of stuff. Now, if you go out on your own, like I said, and find the birth parent, then you just have attorney's fees. Um, and depending on, you know, what all is involved in getting your adoption done is, is about that, you know, anywhere between, I'd probably say about up to 10,000. Any l less of an enforceable right, if you do it on your own and you get a lawyer to go through probate than you would have in circumstances where you went through an agency? Not necessarily. So probably you have the same legal rights as long as the final adoption process is taking place through the probate court. And as long as it's here in Alabama. That's interesting. Uh, another question we have here, can the adoptive parents help the birth mother with her living expenses? They can. And in the state of Alabama, um, you do have to get pre-approval for the birth mother expenses, but you can help the birth mother with her birth mother, you know, with her pregnancy expenses. So we have a lot of people who will call us up and say, hey, my birth mother, you know, is needs her, her pre made uh, prenatal medicine paid for and mm -hmm. and might need some clothing because you know she's getting a little bit larger through the pregnancy and stuff like that and, and those are acceptable expenses to pay we just have to you know basically petition the court and, right. and allow them to grant the petition okay. uh, when we come back from break I want to talk a little bit more about costs but I also want to talk about why someone would choose a DHR adoption over another uh, I think Amy's outlined several of those issues already uh, but uh, I want to talk about the age of the child and DHR versus you know maybe a general adoption and how that works okay all right, we're stepping aside our final break of the evening. As we do so, a great opportunity for you to check out the ways to join this conversation. Now's the time for you to get in on the action. Would love to hear from you. Stay tuned. We've got more of the attorneys coming right up. I'm Tyler Vale with the law firm of Hollis Wright. In court, attorneys are not allowed to tell jury certain things. For example, we cannot talk about a defendant's net worth, meaning the defendant's ability, resources, or insurance to pay a verdict. In this week's Legal 411, we're answering the question, why can't lawyers talk about a defendant's net worth to a jury? Rule 403 of the Alabama Rules of Evidence states, although relevant, Evidence may be excluded if its probative value is substantially outweighed by the danger of unfair prejudice, confusion of the issues, or misleading the jury, or by considerations of undue delay, waste of time, or needless presentation of cumulative evidence. Long-standing Alabama cases have held that the net worth of a defendant falls under this catch-all rule. The reasoning behind the rule is that if a jury knows a defendant is wealthy, then the jury might award more money to the plaintiff. And this goes one step further. If an attorney makes any remarks that suggest the defendant is responsible because he is rich and the plaintiff is poor, that can be grounds for a new trial. If you're ever on a jury, the reality in our state is this. In almost every lawsuit that goes to trial, the attorneys representing both the plaintiff and the defendant have already looked at whether there is sufficient insurance coverage or assets to satisfy a verdict. The reality is this. The parties would not pursue a civil lawsuit if damages could not be paid after a jury returns a verdict. So even though lawyers cannot mention the net worth of a defendant during a trial, there could still be resources available to pay a verdict in court. Please remember, your call, email, or text to the attorneys is free. All of us at Hollis Wright want to help answer your questions on real issues you face. Remember, a competent lawyer will respond to every question you send in. That's our pledge and promise to you.
Well, we're learning a whole lot about adoptions and the law. Would love to have you join our conversation. This is our final segment, so just a few minutes remaining, but take advantage of that opportunity to speak with attorneys who are standing by live and also uh, be a part of the conversation with the information you'll find at the bottom of the screen there. Josh? So, Amy, we, we were talking about the home study and how that process works. Um, a question we've got, uh, what, what does that cost? Do you have to pay if you're going through an adoption um, through uh, either DHR or through an adoption agency, do you pay for the home study program? And I think it's only, is, is it only applicable to DHR? It's not only applicable okay. to DHR. The only adoption that you do not have to have a home study on is if it's a closely related or a step parent adoption. But if you're, you're doing a private adoption or a DHR adoption, you do have to do a home study. If DHR does your home study for you, um, it doesn't cost anything. They come in and they do everything for you. It's part of the process of becoming the foster parent to adopt. Um, and like I said, they don't charge you anything for that or for the, the adoption process. You just have to pay court costs for that. Um, and then, of course, you have the, um, the, the private adoptions and, and, you know, your agency will charge you for that um, or your, your social worker will charge you. And that, that can range anywhere from about 1000 all the way up to about $3,500. And you had mentioned to me earlier um, about um, going through an adoption agency, are those generally going to be infants, um, just born yes. infants? They, they can be infants and they're normally infants. There are some times that the agencies will find you some smaller children, um, but most of the time it, it's an infant. And then with DHR, um, do you have the ability to request through DHR an infant or is the age sometimes older with DHR? How does that work? Um, usually with the DHR adoptions, they're going to place you with children who've already been born and taken out of the home. So, I mean, the, the children are going to be on the older, older stage. Um, however, you know, a lot of times if you've adopted, you know, they'll try to make, if a sibling is born, you know, a sibling can go into your house. So it all just kind of depends on the, the situation that you're in with DHR. And you can request certain things, but, you know, it's the more you request, yeah. you know, the, the tighter your, your placement's going to be. Yeah. You need to get a lawyer involved early in this, is what I'm assessing. Yes. <laughs> Sounds like I know, I, I mean that. Oh, yeah. yeah. What, what I'm assessing is you don't just pick up the phone and call DHR and say, this is what I'd like to do. I'm sure they have a, a counsel, you know, some, some type of worker that will help you with that. But you need someone to lead you through this process because it sounds to me like there, if you don't do it right, you, this is, could be catastrophic. Yeah. You could build a tremendous relationship with a child, not have proper legal right, and then lose that child down the road to a birth mother because you didn't go through probate correctly. Mm -hmm. I mean, so I, you'd want to get a lawyer involved early. Absolutely. Another good question we've got here. Can the adoptive parents get help with the adoption expenses? You said it could be up to $60,000, so that, that's pretty pricey. Yeah, if you're, um, if you're going through an adoption, there's all kinds of help out there for you. You know, we all hear nowadays about the GoFunding stuff that people are doing for, mm -hmm. you know, individuals. We have couples that, um, who have done the GoFunds um, however, there are agencies out there that can help you set up, and it's almost like a GoFund account, but it makes it a 501c3 so they can give to you in that account, you know, as a tax deduction. Mm -hmm. um, and so, and oh. then that way you can use that towards your adoption and it just goes into your fund. Then there's also other, you know, agencies who give out grants. Um, and then there's matching agencies that says, hey, if you can raise this much money, we'll match that. Wow. Um, and then there's direct grants that, you know, they'll come through and if you, if you do your application and everything else and they accept you, they'll basically say, here is the money for your adoption. Um, you mentioned something earlier in the last segment that I, I, I wanted to ask you about, and that is step-parent adoptions. Yes. Um, I was a product of that because my stepfather uh, adopted me when I was younger. Um, so I obviously went through that process, so that's kind of near and dear to my heart. But um, it sounds like, is that a simpler process than going through oh, yeah. adopting a new child? Okay. Oh, and yeah. So, but you hear about this and you see these great YouTube videos of children where the stepfather says, I'd like to adopt you, and there's this really heartfelt yeah. moment, mm -hmm. kind of a cool concept. Mm -hmm. I mean, is that something you guys do too? Oh yeah, we do the step-parent adoptions and the related adoptions. Um, step-parent adoptions are, um, why they're much simpler is because the child's already in your home. Um, they do need to be in your home for at least a year before the um, probate court will allow the adoption to go forward, um, or at least finalize the adoption, I guess I should say. Um, and then of course, related adoptions, the same thing, they want you to be in the home, you know, for a year and, and, and you can, you know, if you've got your grandbabies or whatever, you can um, give us a call and we'll walk you through that process and get that done for you. 
Tell us about something called the adoption credit. What, what is that? The adoption tax credit just basically says that um, it's, it's the federal government's incentive to, to do adoptions. Um, it's a very expensive process like we talked about, you know, and so what the government's come through and done is it says that if you do an adoption, you can get up to $13,500 back as a tax credit on your taxes. Okay. And it's usually within the year of the final decree. Um, and, the, um, and as long as you don't make, I think it's over um, 240 something, um, you can get that tax credit. So that really is a pretty good incentive. It's a great incentive. I mean, you take a $60,000, you can subtract $13,000 off yeah. of it, depending on what income you make. That's very, very interesting. Can I ask one, one yeah. because this is interesting, another about once the adoption is finalized, who gets access to that file? Because that's a pretty personal information. Yes. Um, once the adoption is finalized, the, final, the, the adoption is sealed. Um, so even as the attorney, I cannot go back in there and open up your file or anything. Um, that has to be petitioned and the court will make the decision if the file is opened back up. However, when the child turns 19 years old, um, they can write down to the vital stats in Montgomery and ask for their original birth certificate and they will give them a copy of their original birth certificate. Wow. Well, um, time has just flown. Less than two minutes remaining in the program. I want to give both of you an opportunity for a final thought. Name if you would. Uh, you go first, please. Okay. Um, I guess I would just tell everybody that you know adoption is a great thing it's very emotional um, but the the outcome at the end is just absolutely you know magnificent and that if you're gonna you know if you're really interested in adoption contact an attorney um, and they can walk you through the process and just make sure that it's done properly you can tell she's passionate. I almost yeah. thought you were going to shed a tear there. No, it's cool. What you do for a living is, is really cool, and it's very admirable. And there are not a lot of lawyers that do this um, for a living. And, you know, you need someone to hold your hand through the process during yeah. those times. And Amy and her firm are a great example of that. And not only is it a great example, it's a great example that you started, you worked your way through yeah. paralegal into law. I mean, that's a really, it's just a calling. I mean, some people have a calling. and, and um, uh, you've got one, so I'm, I'm really impressed with, with you. You did a great job Thank on the you. show. You said before the show, you, you weren't sure if you're going to like this TV thing. What do you think? You okay? Not too bad. All right, you did a good job. You did yeah. a very good job. Nice You've great nice people work. with me. Um, but no, you know, if, if you forget Amy's name, remember our name, we will get you to Amy. If right. you've got a question about adoption or uh, down the road you recognize, hey, there was that adoption show they had, yeah. uh, get to us. We can get you to Amy without question. Yeah, fantastic. Nice to meet you. Thanks for being nice with us. You. Uh, thank you so much and thank you as well. As always, we appreciate you joining us each and every Sunday evening. We're wrapping things up at the firm of Hollis Wright available to you. Uh, the website hollis-wright.com, a great way. Uh, that They're open 24 hours a day online in ways you can continue to chat with them. Thanks for being with us. We'll see you next time right here on The Interns. Thanks for watching The Attorneys, sponsored by Hollis Wright.